Hey, let's do this. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this is my first time in Cincinnati. And I didn't know much about Cincinnati before coming here, except I always thought it was slightly unfair that Mississippi, if you follow Mississippi from the ocean upstream, you end up not going up the Ohio River, but you end up going somewhere else. Ohio River contributes a, a third more water to the Mississippi than the sort of the, the upstream part that is called Mississippi. I always thought that was unfair. But, but Ohio, big, mighty river, it was fun to see it for the first time. I flew in from, uh, from California yesterday, and I'm going to talk about JavaScript and Firebase game programming and how I use them to become a better dad. So uh, first, a little something about me. There we go. Uh, so this is another picture of me when not wearing a uh, Ohio DevFest t-shirt. Um, and uh, I was, my name is Martin Omander. I was born and uh, raised in Sweden. So lived there, uh, actually had my first job there as well. I've been, for the last 17 years, I've been living in Silicon Valley. And, uh, oh right, uh, I worked at three startups in Silicon Valley as a software engineer. And uh, one of them even went public, woohoo! Uh, so um, uh, I've been at Google for 10 years. I, I, has, has, has it been that long? So I, I had to look it up if, when I'm creating this slide. Google is a hard place to leave. And uh, my current job at Google is to support Google developer groups. So this is Google Developer Group of Columbus and Cincinnati, who's putting, they are putting on this event. Um, has anybody here been at any other Google Developer Group events except this DevFest, like the regular monthly ones? I see some, no ones? Okay, great. Those of you who haven't, look up Google Developer Group Cincinnati. They uh, run monthly events, or Columbus. And if you go anywhere else in the world, or if you're anywhere else, there's something like six to 700 Google developer groups all over the world. And uh, they meet, uh, most of them meet monthly and talk about uh, Android, cloud, web uh, development. So my job is awesome because I get to travel around and meet great developers. I've talked to some of you already and, and I learn so much on these trips, I love it. There is one drawback with my job though, and this is it. This is actually taken, I think it's me and a coworker. We've been circling Dallas for, for two hours. We ran out of fuel, have to divert to Oklahoma City. I don't know much about Oklahoma City, except that it's very hard to find a good meal at midnight uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, so there's a lot of travel involved. And uh, when, uh, when you have a family, that gets kind of hard. Um, so when you travel too much, you want to make sure you have really quality time with your kids when you're home. And if you're a software guy like I am, quality time means doing a software project with your kids. <laughs> Yay! So I'm going to talk about a project I built with my son where we used uh, JavaScript and Firebase. And if you one big takeaway from this talk is if you take Firebase on one hand and JavaScript on the other and you put them together, what you get is a better dad, that's me, and a happier son. That's my son playing the game we built together. Uh, we decided to build a game uh, because I don't know if you tried programming with your kids, but it is surprisingly hard to make your kid, uh, kids enthusiastic about building business applications. <laughs> I tried, but game it was. So games are interesting. <laughs> games are interesting because most, most of us here build, I mean, there are probably very few game developers here. Are there any game developers? Oh, <laughs> two? Three, oh, three, cool. So most of us build business apps or non-game apps, right? And that's what I've been doing for all these years in all these startups. And, and consulting and so on. So this was a new experience for me. And I pretty soon realized that games have completely different requirements or, or tougher requirements than our business apps have on them. So um, they need to be fast because everything in a game is, is real time. 
Uh, they need to be shared because most games these days are multiplayer <coughs> games. So they're shared in a totally different way than, um, than business apps are. And they need to be user friendly. A lot of those apps that we've built, certainly apps I've built in previous jobs, I've had the luxury of I built an app and the users better use it because otherwise their employer would fire them. <laughs> but with a game, you can't have that. It has to be user friendly out of the box. So this was a real challenge for me because I haven't built games before. Uh, so, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about how, how I addressed, how we worked through each of these uh, aspects. All right, so um, the, uh, we picked a use case for our game, and our use case is game night. Uh, so this uh, game night at our house is usually 12 to 15 people, kids and adults mixed. We have dinner, uh, Swedish meatballs, and uh, then we play games, board games. And that's great fun, except if you are, let's say you're 10 people around the table and you're playing a board game, that means 90% of the time you're sitting there waiting for somebody else to make their move. And 10% of the time you are actually active and pushing your little cardboard pieces around. Well, so it turns out though that pretty much everyone who comes to game night, even the little six and seven year old kids, brings a supercomputer with them. So this, your phone, our idea was this can mediate your moves so everybody can be active the whole time instead of waiting 90% of the time. So we picked a, next we picked a setting and uh, the setting, uh, we're very both, both me and my son are very much into science fiction, so we picked a setting of you're on a command bridge of a, a, a spaceship and you all have different roles on the spaceship, you're captain and engineer and, and so on. All right, so it was time to start building. Now, I built business apps, and, um, and I've built them a certain way, and uh, the way that most of, uh, many of us, perhaps most of us, build apps and were taught to build apps is uh, this classic model of uh, three tiers, right? Presentation, sort of business logic in the middle, and a data tier. So uh, this is tried and true. The drawback with this model, though, is that these three pink boxes here all contain your stuff. So whenever there's a bug or whenever you need to build a new feature, you need to mess with three boxes, probably in three different languages. And when your code actually runs, three different things need to execute. So it's slow to build and slow to run, and it turns out games are Many games aren't built this way. And also, I go around to a lot of startup events, and so I speak to really interesting people who are a lot smarter than I am. And, and there was a, a partner from Union Square Ventures I met uh, at, at one event, and he said, you know, most startups don't build their stuff like this anymore. And I was like, oh, my eyes, my ears perked up, because the way startups build things today, that's the way the rest of us building business apps are gonna build things tomorrow. He said, they don't have time to mess around with three tiers. They don't do this. You don't have to do this anymore. The new way of, of building apps that all, most of the startups uh, he sees um, is this, a one tier architecture. So instead of having three pink boxes that you, you deal with, you just choose a service such as Firebase. I talk about Firebase because I, I work at Google and Firebase is a Google product. Uh, there are others as well. But you now only have one tier here of your code, and then you have a really good library, and you, the, the uh, library handles authentication and data storage and all of that, so you don't have to write all that boilerplate. And this is, of course, if you're a web developer. I'm a web developer. Uh, I've just dabbled a bit in, in um, uh, mobile development. If you do mobile development, it, it looks pretty much the same. It's just the client libraries in a different language. Okay, so, so this was good. One tier sounds good. One third of the work, that's great. Uh, only one pink box to deal with. Now, then the next thing was uh, uh, synchronizing the game state. So I've always tried to build computer games. That's how I learn new programming languages. Most of the computer games I've built, I've never even got to a playable state because it is hard to build multiplayer games and set up sockets and resolve resol uh, uh, conflicting game states and, and so on. 
So um, when I looked at Firebase, I was excited because it works like this. If you have, you can have multiple clients hooked up to your instance of Firebase, so your database within Firebase. And if one of them uh, sends an update to, to uh, saves data to the database, then all the other clients get notified of that. So this is great for business apps, but also great for games. So uh, when, when I discovered this about Firebase, we decided to use Firebase for, uh, for, our, um, uh, for our back end. All right, uh, yeah, so not only is Firebase a, a one-tier architecture, which is awesome in and of itself, and I know many people use Firebase just for that reason, it is also a real-time architecture. Um, because uh, player, uh, players, users, don't have to reload uh, their app page or their web page. They get the updates in, in page in real time. All right, uh, that's a lot of talk. Uh, I think we need to play some games here. So let's see if this will work here. Let's see, I'll put this down. Start this instead. All right, very good. Let's see. <coughs> We will do maybe like that, and oh, this will be interesting. We're running on a fairly low resolution here. This will be a good test for my game to see how it handles low resolution. Okay, so far so good. Whoa, oh, we have lots of people have been in here playing my game since I demoed it last. Fun, fun. Okay, so we're gonna play a simple mission here because I'm not good at talking and playing, and I'm playing two players at the same time, so which is kind of crazy. So, um, uh, okay, so we're gonna create the simplest mission there is. Uh, we'll pick a random ship name, the Barracuda. Oh, excellent spaceship name. Two players, shakedown crews. What can go wrong? Okay, there we go. So we'll join here as a pilot. And over here, we'll hope the network is with us. All right. Space is white, apparently. <laughs> While well, we're waiting for the network. Oh, okay, okay. Full screen mode? No, it'll be confusing if we try full screen mode for both. All uh, right. Maybe, can you see that? That's kind of, uh, okay, yeah, we'll try it out. So, over here on the right, we have the pilot, and I'll just do, do like this. You see there's a little gap between them here. Um, so we have two players, uh, the pilot over here, and the uh, navigation officer over here. So, let's see, we'll turn on the navigation computer. Navcomp powering on. All right, good stuff. We'll turn on, oh good, Nef so now you see this is a zoomed out view of space and these are three mission objectives, three navigation buoys we have to uh, navigate to and now navigation computer turned on so the, the bearings, the, the pilot can see the bearings there. We'll turn on the radar as well so we can see if there's anything in the way and, uh, and then it's all about collaboration, right? It's a collaborative game, so the pilot, uh, there we go. Radar fully charged. Okay. We turn that on, very good. All right, so let's plot a course here for there. So, okay, uh, pilot, uh, plot. Uh, Radar bearing, fully charged. Bearing uh, two, 289. Okay, very good. So the pilot's there. Oh, oh dear, what's going on? High CO2 level. <laughs> okay, something is not right uh, on uh, USS Barracuda here. Okay, but we are, we're, we go boldly. Let's see. So we start plotting course. Oh, it's getting really fuzzy. Uh, what's what is going on? Uh, did I? Oh, I forgot to turn on life support over here. Uh, <laughs> shoot. Now it's kind of hard to see where that is. Um, let's see. Do we? Oh, oh, oh my gosh. We are. Oh, we entered an asteroid field here. Uh, this is. Uh, 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 let's, uh, that was stressful. Whew. <laughs> let's get, okay, so this. <laughs> so at this point, this is usually where the recriminations begin. 
So my son says, Dad, you lost us the mission again. And I was like, but there were so many buttons and there were so many things to turn on. And he's like, well, Dad, you know, they're too building a computer game and playing a computer game are two different skill sets. And you have one of them. <laughs> So instead of playing a computer game poorly and, uh, and uh, showing you more uh, space uh, disasters, I'm going to talk about building the computer game because that's something I actually know something about. So we'll go through some lessons learned here and there were plenty of them uh, because as I said, I come from a business software background, not a gaming background. But I do believe that a lot of these things I learned made me a better programmer and will uh, let me build better business apps. So I, I, mean, I will share specifically those lessons because these are lessons that all of you can use in your business software. And maybe the, maybe the two of you who are game programmers learn something too. Okay, so the first one was uh, game state, sharing game state on, uh, with Firebase. Was that even feasible? What would the code look like? Would it be messy? Would it not? Uh, that was the first thing we set up, a very simple demo to ourselves that uh, looked out of range. There we go, that looked like this. So you saw this earlier. We have two players here, one on the left, one on the right. The player on the left creates a new mission and then that mission appears in this, uh, on this web page in this HTML table. So it's worth noting, uh, so the left-hand player is now selecting a new uh, shakedown crew, it's very good, clicks OK, and boom, at virtu almost the same time, that mission, a new row appears for both players, regardless of where they are in the world. Uh, so uh, what, what does the code for this look like? Um, and uh, it turns out it's not that complicated. It was easier than we thought when we started building. So let's look at it, uh, because the way it works under the covers is this. So you, all of those of you who have built web apps, you've done this, right? You have a user interface in HTML, and then you have JavaScript sitting behind that. So easy peasy, we'll, all, all of us who have done web programming have done that. And the JavaScript and, and the HTML forms in the HTML and user actions in the, from the HTML page are reflected in, in uh, JavaScript variables being updated. What you get, what you're doing in addition with, um, if you do a Firebase, is that you then, your JavaScript is then hooked up to a Firebase database somewhere in the cloud, on a Google, in a Google data center somewhere. And the cool part is of course this, that then uh, the, uh, uh, that others are hooked up to that database too, so they get real time updates. Now we're gonna dive into code here, and basically the code are all these arrows you're seeing here. So let's talk about what's actually in those arrows. Uh, so many people, for, for this first arrow up here, user interface to HTML, many people write raw JavaScript, many others use uh, frameworks, and uh, any web developers here who've used frameworks for hooking up HTML, and, yeah? Shout out a few framework names. Polymer, Polymer yeah. Angular. Angular, very good, yeah. Meteor, yeah, yeah, Gwit, yeah, Dojo. Dojo, yeah, good stuff, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Some of them I have on the slide. Uh, so here you can raw JS or some of these frameworks. I had also as a um, as, as a uh, goal for myself to learn Angular when building this uh, game. So so I, I used Angular over here. Um, excellent framework. If you haven't used it, um, it's great. So um, then the nice people in the Firebase team they implemented the second arrow for us, so we don't have to. Uh, there we go. So they wrote uh, this, this, uh, client libraries for Angular, for Backbone, Ember, React, and, and possibly others that uh, I didn't find on the page. And uh, because I wrote, I used Angular uh, over there on the left, I ended up using the Angular Fire library on the right. Okay, what does the code actually look like? Like this. Oh, three-way data binding, yes. So uh, instead of just binding your HTML to your JavaScript, that's two-way data binding. A lot of frameworks do that. When you hook up Firebase to this, you have three-way data binding. So HTML, JavaScript, 
and your database all hooked up. So if one of those three change, changes, then the other two change automatically. Very powerful feature. But let's look at the code. So, uh, okay, so here we have an HTML table with one mission, one ship in, in the, uh, one game in the table. So a pretty basic uh, table, and the way it looks like if you do use Angular, like I did, was uh, it's a standard HTML table. If you've seen HTML before, you, you know what this looks like, except you might not recognize where it says ng repeat up here. So ng repeat is Angular's way of saying this element and all sub elements will be repeated and it will actually be repeated once for every object in the games array or games list. And then you just say, okay, uh, so I want the, in the first cell, the ship name should be listed. In the second cell, the mission name should be listed. In the third cell, there will be a join button and so on. So HTML, the HTML part of this is pretty simple. Now, in the JavaScript part, we need to define the games array. And this is how you do it. Uh, this comes from the server, right? So we just we need to create a database connection to uh, to the uh, Firebase database, and then from that from there we just use the Firebase array object, and boom, we're done. So this is all the code it takes to have two, three, a hundred different people look at a table at an HTML table and for that HTML table to be updated in real time with the database uh, contents. So if a database row is added, all the 100 people who are watching this page will in real time see a new row popping up in the table. If, um, if a, a ship name is changed in the database, everybody who watches this page will boom, instantaneously see the ship name change on their page. And if a, if a row is deleted from the database, it, it will delete from all users without their having to reload the page. So this is a big deal. And uh, I, I will, I've been writing business software where things all, don't always have to be real time. So I thought this was pretty cool. But in games, of course, things have to be real time. Uh, so uh, if you remember, there was one more thing to it. This is just viewing the database contents, right? we actually need to create new games as well. So there was a create game button. Let's look at what the code for that is. So again, the HTML is pretty simple. If you've seen HTML before, you might recognize the button tag. And then we have a click handler there, uh, ng click. That is sort of angular speak of saying on click. If you use JavaScript, you, you might have used on click before. So pretty simple uh, HTML. Now let's look at the JavaScript. This is the part where we create a new record in the database. It would be like this. Uh, we create a, uh, a JSON object or data structure uh, which has all the game stuff in it. And then we uh, just call add on our games array. And it has now been saved in the database. So it's not a lot of code. And uh, I know actually people, I, I met uh, um, folks who, who actually use, they don't use, need Firebase's um, real-time features. They just use Firebase because they have to, there's less code to write to connect with the database. No connection strings or any, any of that messy stuff that we as business developers have, have been using for a long time. Okay, so Firebase made it easier than we had actually expected to, to sync multiplayer updates. So that was great. Uh, but the big question then, of course, is, is it fast enough for a game? So this is Chrome DevTools. Um, anybody here used Chrome DevTools? In, oh, yay, excellent, excellent. Uh, good stuff. So this is one view, a flame chart, I think it's called, the timing chart from Chrome DevTools. I actually wrote a simple version of the game to test out is Firebase fast enough to sync game data. Um, and uh, what we're seeing here is uh, sending the data, so packaging it all up. We have about 10 kilobytes of game data. Packaging it all up took about 17 milliseconds and then sending it over the network in, you know, with my laptop, in my house, with my router, uh, took about 28 milliseconds. 
That was the time it took for the data to go to the Google server, for the Google server to think about it and think about who should be notified and so on, and for the first byte to arrive uh, back on the client. And then it took another 41 milliseconds to parse out all the data and, and putting it into the game model. So, so we have 86 milliseconds here in, on my network. Now, 86 milliseconds, let's talk about that. So that's, that's about a twelfth of a second to do all this, okay? Is that fast enough? So, let's say we're building a business app. So maybe we're building a, uh, an app, this is not a game, and maybe we're building an expense report app. And if one person updates an expense report from, you know, submitted to approved, and it takes 86 milliseconds between a manager approving an expense report and the employee seeing that the expense report was approved. Is 86 milliseconds fast enough? Yes, no? Probably, says David, yes. Yes, for business apps that tend to go sort of in lock, uh, that, that go in lockstep like that, 86 milliseconds is plenty fast enough for most things you want to do. Okay, but we're not building a business app here, remember, we're building a game Let's talk about the next type of app, turn-based game. Let's say you build chess in, uh, using Firebase as your backend. Okay, player, white starts, white moves a pawn forward, and uh, it takes 86 milliseconds later, the second player sees the pawn being moved. Is that fast enough? Yes, no? Yes. It's fast enough because user uh, researchers tell us that uh, when you're working with an app, anything under 100 milliseconds appears instantaneous. So yes, certainly fast enough. Okay, but we weren't building a turn-based game, were we? We were building a game that ran 60 frames per second. How about 86 milliseconds then? Is that fast enough? Not really, no, yeah, because if you take one second and slice it up in 60 frames, each frame becomes 16 milliseconds. And this is something that, regardless of whether you use Firebase or what other tool you use, if you're doing things over the network, you're not going to get across the network and do all the data processing needed in 16 milliseconds. So fortunately, we have some really smart people who figured all this out back in the 90s. The folks who wrote Doom and Quake in those games, they figured all of this out. So we can, we can build on what they did. Uh, so Firebase, instantaneous, certainly fast enough for, uh, for business apps. For games, we have to be smart because just like Shani was saying, there's no getting around physics and the speed of light and things like that. So things are going to take uh, longer when you go across the network. Uh, so, uh, okay, so we started building the game then, and, um, and this is what we got. So player one gets a nice, smooth animation, the spaceship moves across the screen beautifully, and then we see the red arrow, that is when data is sent from player one to player two, and, and we can't send, we, we send data at intervals, right? So every interval, then the spaceship on player two screen jumps, and player one gets a nice, smooth animation, player two, I think it would be a stretch to even call it an animation at this point. It looks terrible. But this was kind of like what the first version of our game looked like. Uh, and the reason for that, if we draw a timing diagram of that, is that player one, you see player one here, gets nice smooth 60 frames per second, and then every now and then game state is sent across. And then on player two, the way we had written the code was that the game state was displayed only when player two got data. Okay, terrible, won't work for a game. Nobody will want to play this game. How do we fix this? Any thoughts? Yeah, predict where the ship is gonna go, exactly. Because we have already in player two uh, has the course and speed and such bearing of the ship. Exactly. So. What you do there and uh, what the guys who built Doom and so on back in the 90s figured out is you update local game state for player two and then every now and then when you do get new game state over the network, you just discard your local game state and use what came over the network. And the price you're paying is that whenever you discard local game state here, 
that, that game state you get from the network might actually be a little different than the one you had before. So there might be a little jump and you can measure it. And I measured it in, in our game and it ended up being like one or two uh, pixels. So it was okay. And you can interpolate that too, yeah. So if it's jank there, you can move not the entire uh, distance. Yeah, so great. Okay, first, uh, sol first problem solved. So now we decouple drawing and, uh, and uh, uh, data transfer. So this is one-on-one -on -one stuff. Any good game programmer knows this, except I didn't when I started this project. <laughs> okay, great. So. Uh, we now have this parallel execution, everything is great, except most of us are here are engineers, right? And we know that you, when you start building on a project, you end up, uh, you run head first into some huge engineering problem, like we did here. You work hard, you read up, you do your research, you fix it, like we did here. And what happens then? you run into the second problem that was slightly smaller so that it was sort of hiding behind the first problem, right? And then you research that and you do your test and you fix it and everything's good. And what happens then? The third problem, exactly. It's slightly smaller third problem that was hiding behind the second problem. And then you fix that and then you get a fourth problem, you fix that and the problems get, keep getting slightly smaller and smaller and you keep fixing them and you keep fixing them until you're tired of fixing software and you just say, ship it. <laughs> so we did run into, immediately after fixing this, we felt pretty good about ourselves, but we ran into second problem, which was this. Uh, devices run at different speeds, especially when you have some people playing on a, on a souped up gaming laptop and others bringing a four year old Android phone to the party, right? Very different speeds. So we see this terrible, you know, slow animation for player two, and then every now and then there's game state coming over from player one and there's a big jump. So terrible experience. And what's happening here is that, again, if we look at the, if we, eventually the next slide will come up. I think my laptop crashed. Computers run at different speeds. <laughs> Ooh, look at that. So actually, there's a name for this. So uh, most of us call it the beach ball of death. But there's an official Apple name for this. This indicator you're seeing here, it's turning, it is called the indeterminate progress indicator. Progress is indeed indeterminate. <laughs> well, we'll go on and we'll have it, we'll have the nice little beach ball there spinning and we'll see if we'll get rid of it eventually. So the second problem, uh, the next problem we ran, oh right, different speeds. So, what, 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 <gasps> whoa, we have uh, determinate progress. Oh, oh. Did it, did it. Okay, <sighs> all right, so the, the reason here is that player two updates the game state and draws less frequently than, than player one's device, right? So this will happen, you can't force everybody to bring, uh, to bring uh, latest uh, hardware to game night. Uh, so um, what do you do here, any thoughts? We were stumped when we got to this stage, yeah. You need to have a consistent, yeah, consistent reference time. Yep, yep, you need to have a consistent uh, timing that is not tied to the processor speed. Yep, uh, so uh, there are a couple of ways of, of doing this, uh, but what the first, the key to unraveling this little mystery is to see that out there on the right, it actually says there are two things going on there. Notice that there's an and in that sentence. So there are two things happening, and it turns out that one is slow and one is fast. So here's again our trusty friend Chrome DevTools, and um, the total frame rate, the total time to do all, all this stuff, update game state and draw, is uh, almost three milliseconds. 
and um, updating the game state, this is like adding to the x and y coordinates of the spaceship, that is fast because that, this is just math. This is taking a number and adding a number, another number to it. Uh, then drawing slow because this is UI, this is, uh, goes out on the bus and things like that. So what we can do then is uh, draw, update the game state very often because even that four-year-old Android phone can, can add numbers together 60 times a second. Uh, and then we draw the UI as fast as the device can, can bear it. So uh, we will, uh, and let's actually look at the code for that because this was, this was kind of interesting. So here's how all computer games were written in the 1980s. And if you ever tried to play a computer game from the 1980s on an emulator today, they are ridiculously fast because they're so fast that and they're done and you've lost the game and you haven't even seen what was on the screen because they were written like this. Because all computers ran you know, at roughly the same speed in the 80s. And then in the 90s, we got faster computers. And yeah, and uh, so don't do this at home, kids. This is not a good idea. The way to, so you update the simulation and then you render. So we need to add a little more smarts. And specifically in a browser, we, we uh, would also add at the bottom here, you see request animation frame. So this is a way of you telling the browser, please call this method when you get a chance, will you? Try to call it 60 times per second if you're able to. So we still update the simulation and we render. And then the trick here is, uh, and again, the Doom and Quake guys uh, invented this in the 90s. Uh, the trick here is to actually check when you drew, drew the last frame. And then you just basically, you run the, and you get a delta, and then you run update simulation multiple times. And then you run render only one time. So, uh, you're getting, um, so when you do that, we get a uh, uh, animation. The game runs at the same speed on slow and fast devices, but the animation might be a little choppier on the slow device. All right, so those were some technology uh, lessons we learned. We also learned one, uh, and have to keep relearning, uh, one user interface lesson when, when building games. And I think this is very relevant to business software. Uh, there is, uh, let me take you back, cast your mind back to the 1990s. Virtual reality was really hot the first time around. We didn't really have the computers that could deal with it, but there was a lot of talk about virtual reality. At that time, there was also a book called um, Computers as Theater. And you can see that it's about, that was from the 90s because it has like, oh, it even has featuring post virtual reality. Whoa, what's, what is that even? Who knows? Um, but this is a really interesting book because Brenda Laurel, who wrote this book, she goes through all the things and theory around drama and stagecraft and theater and applies it to computers. And because programming, computers, user interfaces, we, our discipline is sort of baby age compared to drama, right? We've been doing drama for 2,000 years and theater for 2,000 years. And she goes through all these, what, what is important to think of in drama that we should learn from when we're building computer programs. And, and the biggest thing, oh, right. Uh, and when I researched this talk, I, so I have this book in my bookshelf from the 90s. Uh, they also came out with a new edition of this book. And I don't know if this is an, uh, an ironic cover or hipster or what, I don't get it. But even I could have, built a better cover than this, I think. So let's forget that that ever existed. The old one is really nice. Say the text is the same, though. And uh, the, if you only remember one thing from this book, the biggest thing for me was this. If it can't be seen, it doesn't exist. And we as programmers are at a disadvantage here because we know what the code does. We wrote the code. Users have no such clue. The only clue they have is what they see on the screen. So we have to be really careful with displaying everything that's important. And the corollary is, if, if something is significant in our, in our software, it needs to be on the screen. And I certainly sin against this all the time, and I know many of you probably do as well. 
Also, on a, on a side note, it doesn't help either that a lot of uh, that, that uh, our users are normal people, and many of us engineers, I, don't, I speak certainly for myself here, I'm kind of an introvert with a rich inner life. I like to puzzle out what does the computer do right now. Most people don't have any patience for that. If it's on the screen, it's there. If it's not on the screen, it doesn't exist. So we ran into trouble with this again and again with playtesting. And I'll show you an example here. Um, we have, here's the engineer's console, where the engineer runs the main reactor, auxiliary reactor, great. And down there on the left, we have the fuel. So everything's good, works perfectly. But when we, people playtested this, they were like, I'm halfway through the mission and it says I'm out of fuel, what's up with that? And I was like, well, dude, you're running the reactor at full blast the whole time. Of course, you burn through all the fuel. But, and for me, I wrote the code, so I know the equation, that the fuel consumption equation here. But users don't. They just see fuel that's at some state. They don't understand why it's there. And uh, they see the reactor up there. So we had reactor is important. It's on screen, check. Fuel is important, it's on screen, check. Fuel consumption is important. Nowhere on the screen to be found. So uh, what we're doing now, if uh, the network will cooperate with us. Oh dear. Okay, we won't run the animation because the network is slow here, but um, what, we, what we're doing now is we're showing the actual fuel level here. It looks like this sort of yellowish liquid over here. And then we have uh, these kind of fuel pump looking things. And uh, when you turn on a reactor, then these start to fill up with this yellow liquid and start spinning. And the higher uh, power you run the reactor on, the faster it spins. So now we're testing this with players right now, and hopefully they both understand it. And there's, so when you're building software, we've all, business software developers, sinned against this, right? Show the important pieces and the important processes as well on screen to users. That will cut down on training and increase user satisfaction a lot. This is in playtesting, so I don't know yet uh, if this is the, what, what we're going to do, uh, final uh, uh, fix for this. Okay, so good stuff. So uh, we've talked, you can do tons of stuff with the Firebase S SDK. I've only touched on, I've used two for my game the real-time database, and hosting your files. So all your HTML, CSS, images, JavaScript, all that stuff I host on Firebase. So it's served up by the Google uh, uh, network and super fast all over the world. There are lots of other features uh, that are in Firebase, especially if you're a mobile developer. Lots of stuff here you should do. Uh, you should uh, try out in your apps. You can do A-B testing and uh, uh, crash reporting, tons of, tons of cool stuff. So, um, there are high expectations of games. They need to be fast, shared, and user-friendly. We used Firebase for our game, and that meant that uh, we got real-time data, so we managed to build something that was fast. It was shared because this data is shared automatically by, by Firebase across all clients. And finally, we were able to make it user-friendly because if you need data, you don't need to make an, uh, a JSON call, AJAX call across the network. You have all the data already in your local client because whenever it changes, you get updates from the server. And with that, that's the end of my talk. And oh, right, so high expectations of games, but increasingly you see these expectations on your software, even if you're writing business software. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we'll do a little bit of Q&A, and um, then we'll have lunch. But a very important thing to remember is, while you're all doing Q&A, or people asking questions and I'm answering them, if you're not asking a question, you need to go to that bit.ly link and fill out a survey for this particular talk because in about seven minutes, we'll do a drawing for a Google Play, $50 Google Play card. And it will be one of the lucky people who filled out the survey who will win. Any questions? Yeah.
nefarious person, I can look at your JavaScript and your app and figure out how to just dump stuff into the Firebase database. So the Firebase database, how can I protect that? Yeah, how, if your nefarious user can look at reverse engineer the JavaScript um, and uh, run and send updates, uh, their own updates to the server. Right, so I can always win the game because I'm just, I'm not going to play, I'm just going to... You're just going to send I'm awesome gonna data send to the server. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some of this we, um, we avoided by having a collaborative game. Uh, but um, uh, we also, also there are uh, rules. So you can write server-side rules of how data can be updated and uh, access control and things like that. And I haven't actually used all that because we didn't need to for our game. But uh, there is there's things like that you can write on the server that will alleviate some of that. Yeah. Okay. Good question. I like it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. What kind of databases can Fire can Firebase do? Yeah. Firebase is its own data uh, base, so it's a JSON data store. You send up a uh, JSON tree structure. And then you get updates for either the entire tree or for sub trees of that tree. So it, it runs its own. Uh, to be this quick, it needs to be custom and, and be its own database. So you, Firebase is not something you connect to another database. It is its own database and its own notification mechanism on top. Yeah, what kind of structure is the Firebase database? It is uh, NoSQL, it's a JSON. So you can send up any JSON structure to it. Yeah. So it can be this hierarchical thing. Yeah. How many parameters can you query on with Firebase? Yeah, like uh, most JSON uh, data. Uh, so you basically need to think about how you st structure that JSON tree because how you structure that tree will determine how you'll be able to query on it. Uh, so it's not. Uh, like NoSQL, right, you get great scalability, but you are not able to, with SQL, you can run a big report and scan the entire table and get the sum of everything and things like that. In most NoSQL databases, including uh, Firebase, that is hard to do. So you need to think about how you lay out your data. Yeah. Any, yeah, back there. Yeah, is there some way to give uh, access to different parts of this JSON subtree? And yes, indeed there is. In, in those rules you can write out. For example, you might create one node for every user in your tree and then give that user write access only to their own node and maybe give everybody read access across all nodes, for example. Was the bike back there? Yeah, how was the testing experience? I, I, you don't have a local instance of Firebase. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there isn't a, um, yeah, you don't have a local instance. You have one up in the cloud. So uh, you would, uh, well, if you did this properly, which we didn't do, you would probably have your test database in the cloud, and then you would have a, your production database in the cloud. But both of them would be in the cloud. We, of course, we're cowboy programmers, me and son. We tested everything in production. <laughs> And uh, occasionally broke production mid-game for others, and yeah, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah, Dan. At what point do you start getting into costs for using Firebase? Ah, uh, so does this thing cost anything? Uh, if you're up to a gigabyte of data and up to 100, si 100 simultaneous uh, connections, it's free. And then you pay $50 per month, I forget. You should look it up, but then, then you get unlimited. So uh, it's pretty generous. I've been demoing this for a number of times, uh, for, for a number of times uh, in front of audiences. I've never run over the 100 simultaneous users. Well, except one time. I was speaking at uh, this conference in France. I had 500 students in the audience. We built a chat app together. I was sort of live coding up here and then gave out the address, right? So everybody in the audience could use it. So I had 500 students hammering away at it. And well, I should say 497 students hammering away at it, typing. 
three students actually tried to write denial of service attacks against it, <laughs> which was awesome. And it chugged along, it was just fine. But I did hit my quota then of, uh, I was more than 100 connections. Yeah. Yeah, what if you connect with somebody in Japan on the same game? Yeah, it should work. I mean, it all, uh, I've, I played this uh, in Europe and in US. I haven't played in Japan. So I guess it all depends on how fast the network is to the nearest uh, Google ingestion point where you go into the Google network. But yep, yeah, it, it's, it's global. Yeah, back there. Yeah, what about business rules and, and validating data and so on? You typically do that on the server, right? Uh, so it's interesting. Every single time I talk about Firebase, I get that question. <laughs> and every single time I go back to the Firebase team in Mountain View and say, I've heard this is what people are telling us. And every single time they say, yes, we know, we know. So. I don't know about the future, but they've heard it, yes. <laughs> yeah. That hard copy fight that you mentioned, you know, 100 simultaneous connections. So is that like a hard limit and at 100 it cuts you off and says like, oh, yeah, sorry, you're going to have to wait and pay $50? Or is it like, okay, there's spikes going here, but now we're going to charge you $50 at the end of the month? Or yeah, yeah, what happens when you get that, you're on the free tier and you get that 101st simultaneous user? Well, first of all, it's, it's, um, uh, even if you have thousands of users, you probably don't have them all connected at the same time. But OK, so you hit that 101st user, which happened at my demo in France with the students and the denial of service attack. Um, so uh, it was reported to me, and I actually saw it in the logs later, that the 101st and 102nd and 103rd, all those people will just get an, uh, an error message saying that, sorry, this is at capacity. All right, how's it? Oh, question over there. So, uh, I'm sure that there's no local uh, connections to your team. So, for example, if you have something like this through Firebase and you start it offline, uh, let's say then you send it back over to your team, would it would it find the official network and post the message, or how would that work? Yeah, what happens when you're off the network? Like. These devices, even if you're on a Wi-Fi, that can be very flaky with, with network connectivity. And certainly if you're on, on 4G, your 4G network, or you drive into a tunnel, or you, know, you lose connection, what happens with Firebase? Because it's all, goes, all data goes to the cloud. The client um, library is pretty smart about that and queues up the updates. And then when you regain network connectivity, uh, the the, all the updates are sent up into the cloud. 